Former President Donald Trump and current vegetable in chief Joe Biden visit the southern border, but only one will give a damn and only one will remember it. The show starts now. After Donald Trump made his plans to visit the U.S.-Mexico border public, Joe Biden's people had no choice but to load him up and ship him out there on his own. So Joe's team made the strategic decision to send him to Brownsville, Texas, a region of the southern border that has seen crossings slow thanks to Governor Abbott and infrastructure put in place under Trump. That region is also a more favorable congressional district for Joe, so he actually could have stayed home or went to the local ice cream shop and it would have amounted to the same thing lip service. In contrast, Donald Trump chose to visit Shelby Park, a location that Texas Governor Greg Abbott took control over a few weeks back due to the extreme volume of illegal immigrant crossings. Both trips are important because they underscore the choice Americans have when it comes to perhaps the most important election issue facing us in November and always, immigration and border enforcement. But this issue extends and will extend likely for decades beyond whoever wins in November because 7 million plus have entered under Joe and they've dug in. Thanks in large part to the NGOs and religious organizations who front as philanthropic agencies, but in reality are just as guilty as Joe and Democrats of aiding and abetting this invasion. Well, Rachel Campos Duffy visited one of those NGO sites in Arizona, and I think it's safe to say they were not happy to see her. Um, trying to rent a room? Oh, no, we don't rent rooms. Why? Is this a hotel? We don't. Can you guys get off the property, please? Is this not a hotel? Can you please exit the property? It's private property. Whose private property? There's no, there's no name outside? Can you please help them exit the building? What's the problem? But is this where illegals are being housed with government funding? Can you please get off our property? All of you, please, or I'm going to call the police. Please call them. Okay. Yeah, hi, what is this? Um, you need to leave, please. But I need to know what it is. Oh, Casa okay. Alitas. This is leave, Casa, please. this is an NGO paid for by government money. We're not going to answer any of your questions. Just, can you explain what you do here? No. Why, why is so much secrecy? You know, that's what the American people want to understand. What's happening here? Podemos hablar? Tú puedes hablar con nosotros si quieres. Yeah. No. No, sorry, guys. Huh? You guys cannot come into it is- our shelter. Oh, and Rachel Campos Duffy joins me now. Rachel, uh, you know, they really were not happy to see you. They didn't want you there. There's actually more to this story. They actually angrily confronted you and your cameraman. Can you tell my audience what you experienced there and what, maybe what happened off camera that we didn't even get to see? Sure, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on, Tommy. Um, just love everything that you do. You know, I'm a big fan of yours. Um, look, when I went in, they were just panicked. They were like, you're not supposed to be here. We're a secret, uh, you know, NGO. You're not supposed to know what we're doing. Um, get out of here. And then they said, we're going to call the cops. And, you know, after I saw the footage, I'm like, you know, I did say, go ahead, call them. But what I should have said was, I'm going to call the cops on you because every single person here has been trafficked by the cartels here and you're just part of that pipeline um i'm i'm very suspicious of everything going on there because come on you know if you're proud of what you're doing you want everyone to see it um and so they know they're, they're doing something that's not good and they'll say oh we're protecting their privacy um but that's not really what it is anyway we left after that happened and then we got a tip that there was going to be another drop off of illegal aliens the next morning, very early in the morning. So we were there by 5.30 a.m. And when we came, the old ancient uh, security guard that you saw there, they, they took him off the beat and they put this really huge big guy on who was very aggressive, probably more aggressive than the NGO wanted. And he got in my cameraman's face. He grabbed his phone when he did the phone hit back at his mouth, he got a bloody lip, but then he grabbed the phone and he threw it. And that wasn't the end of it because when we came that morning, um, we also had a car, uh, our car there, and also following us was uh, Congressman Andy Biggs because we were gonna go to the border together. Um, But we decided to stop off here because we had heard about this drop off. And somebody, a black guy wearing a mask, a COVID mask, started throwing rocks at our car. He had come from out of the, 
Casa Lita's building and was sort of in the in the front where there's like a grassy area in the front of the hotel. And they threw rocks at our car. They threw rocks at the congressman's car. And then they also threw a brick, which almost hit my my cameraman's head. Thankfully, everything was okay. And then we left after that. I mean, look, you, you, you pretty much know what you're getting there. You know, these are people who don't want you to see what's going on. And I guess my takeaway is that these NGOs, um, you know, they have names like Casa Alitas and their Casa Alitas is affiliated with Catholic Relief Services. There are, but there are other ones. There are Jewish, Lutheran, there are all these NGOs. And they're basically shadow bureaucracies, shadow government, even shadow political parties. And what they do is the work of the Democrat Party. Um, this is a very intricate um, and sophisticated human traffic trafficking operation. The NGOs are deep in South and Central America, helping people figure out how to get up to the border, connecting them with maps and, and, and probably to the cartels themselves. And then once they come through, just think about it, Tommy, these, these cartels need these NGOs mm -hmm. um, because when they charge anywhere from five to $12,000 for someone to come across our border, that includes the price of an airplane airfare or a bus ticket to go into the country, you know, wherever they want. And when I interviewed them, because I also went to a soft shelter on the Indian reservation uh, south of Tucson, right on the border. And, you know, I said, where are you going? Because, you know, I can speak Spanish. And I was able to talk to all of them before the border patrol got to them. And they said, I'm going to Oregon. I'm going to, a lot of them are going to Oregon. I'm going to Oregon. Mm. I'm going to New Jersey, I'm going to New York. Well, that's part of the price. They know that's built into the price. The American taxpayer is going to give them a hotel, a place to hang out until they get their, their airfare figured out. And then our NGOs act as travel agents and get them with a taxpayer funded ticket um, to wherever they want to go. It's really crazy. And it's hard to believe we're paying for it. And we're paying for it, Tommy, with um, different pots of money. So they're rating FEMA pots of money. They're rating uh, HHS money. They're rating money. I had Kat Kamak on my podcast. She said they're rating homeless veterans funds. They're taking money from everywhere to pay for this. And, you know, I want to ask you, because I know that you're a woman of faith, obviously a Catholic woman of faith. And it's really difficult, I think, for people of faith, especially people that are religious in nature and they believe in the church and they be believe in philanthropy. But a lot of these NGOs, as you mentioned, that are part of this are affiliated with churches, religious organizations. So I have to ask you what your thoughts are on that and the religious element of this and the fact that churches are actively aiding and abetting this process. For me also as a Christian, I find that really infuriating. It's embarrassing, actually, for me as a Catholic. It's embarrassing to know that the Catholic Church, through organizations within the Catholic Church, so you're, you're looking at Catholic Relief Services, um, they've become addicted to this government money. They're taking it, and they're so addicted to it that they're willing to turn a blind eye to sex trafficking, even child sex trafficking. Everybody knows um, who is involved in this pipeline that that is happening. And the whistleblowers that are coming out about the child sex trafficking aren't coming out of Catholic Relief Services, Lutheran Services. Um, they're not coming from there. There are other people who are blowing the whistle on this. So this is deeply embarrassing for me as, as a Catholic woman. Um, who loves her church. Uh, but I think I have a duty as a Christian woman to expose it and 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 to somehow do something uh, to, to get them to stop. If they can't stop because they don't have the moral um, fortitude and integrity to do that, then maybe shame will work. Sadly, it doesn't look like that's the case. And I think the only thing that will stop this is the American people knowing about it and enough of them just, uh, you know, talking to their members of Congress, um, enough of them saying, I'm going to, you know, vote for Donald Trump or whoever it is that can cut off the financial spigot to this. It's it's not just what, what's happening to the children and the women who are being sex trafficked, but just think about it. When the next Hurricane Sandy comes, 
when the next Hurricane Katrina comes, when the next tornado comes, there's going to be less money for American citizens who paid into FEMA to have those resources. It's really shameful. Right. And it's not going to end anytime soon because it's not as if these people come over and they get their bus, their plane ticket, and all of a sudden they're off our dime. They're still being funded. They're still getting payments. They're still getting entitlements. Then they have kids. Those kids get entitlements. And then the family, therefore, gets more entitlements. So this is a never ending cycle that's going to bankrupt the United States of America. And it's sickening to me that there are so many what deem themselves to be, you know, charity or religious organizations that are part of this. I'm so glad that you're calling it out. You know, your voice is obviously very strong in this because everybody knows how religious you are and, you know, how much you, you love your church. So it's important for you to speak out. And, you know, I got to say, I'm jealous that you got to go to Arizona and cover the story. You know, you did a great job. You woke up a lot of people. So Rachel, thank you for taking the time. And thank you so much for all that you did to really give this a platform. Thank you, Tommy. Thanks for having me on. You know, I'm a fan. God bless. I'll talk to you soon, Rachel. You got it. Take care. All right, folks, in the age of woke lunacy, it's not always so easy to stand up for what's right, but someone has to. That's where Mid-Vermont Christian School and their girls basketball coach Chris Goodwin come in. After the school forfeited a game against a school with a transgender athlete, the Vermont Principals Association sought to punish the school by banning it entirely from athletic events. Well, that school and its coach are fighting back with a lawsuit led up by our friends at Alliance Defending Freedom and coach Chris Goodwin and Ryan Tucker join me now. I want to thank you both so much for being with me and explaining this. There's been a, a lot of headlines kind of surrounding this controversy ever since it initially happened. Coach Goodwin, I want to start with you. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with what happened and, you know, why the school made the decision not to compete against a school with a transgender athlete, you know, there's a lot of folks that would say, oh, that's just transphobic, it's hateful, it's intolerant. But for you, it's something entirely different. So can you, Coach, please explain why the school and you made that initial decision not to participate? Yeah, I don't view it as transphobic at all. Really, the crux of this case is that we would like the opportunity to decide for ourselves, and the girls on our team would like the ability to make their own decisions as to whether they want to participate in sports against biological males or not. Uh, when we found out about this, uh, this situation, uh, coaches uh, in the state just chatting with them, they told us that there was a biological male playing for another team, and we weren't even on their schedule that during the regular season, but we did see as the playoff seedings began uh, that we might be lined up to play them in the tournament. And we actually uh, approached the state and said, what are our options here? Do we have to play this game? Is there a possibility that our girls would not have to play against a male athlete? And the state basically got back to us and said, really, there's no way around it and we would have to compete against them. So when the playoff seedings did come out, that's when our school made the decision uh, based on our religious beliefs that men and women are created differently. And as, a, as an extension of that, there are physicality differences there. Uh, there's fairness issues. And of course, there's safety issues. Uh, and that's when we decided to forfeit the game and withdraw from the tournament. And as a result of that, they kicked us out of all athletics in the state of Vermont, not just basketball, track, soccer, cross country, volleyball. Other teams are not allowed to play us at all. And we're not allowed to play them. Yeah, they were punishing you, obviously sending a message that this uh, whole culture of transgenderism is going to be accepted or else. And it's really unfortunate because a lot of, you know, female athletes out there are really disgusted to see the way this is trending, but they feel as though they can't say anything. They feel as though they can't opt out because they know that that'll have devastating impact for the rest of their team, their school, their futures, their scholarship opportunities. So this is really going to be in the snowball effect. Uh, Attorney Ryan Tucker with Alliance Defending Freedom, you know, we, we work with you guys a lot uh, showcasing the stories and the people that you obviously represent and amplify. I want to talk and go to the core of legally what this means, because I'm sure that there's going to be many more cases like this, uh, at least similar to this coming up as this whole trend even uh, amplifies more. So can you tell me the legal ramifications of what this case means uh, as far as a precedent? Yeah, absolutely. The state of Vermont thinks that, you know, people can change their sex. And if schools don't adopt this belief, well, then they're kicked out. Uh, you know, put simply, you know, Mid-Vermont Christian School believes that, you know, boys are boys and, and girls are girls. And they've been punished for this belief. And the state can't come in and 
you know, pick a side, a pick a particular viewpoint and say, if you don't believe like us, then 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 you're gone. I mean, ultimately, what the state is trying to do here is really just to, to purge schools and folks like Chris and others at, at the school uh, from the public square. You mentioned that, Tommy, that, you know, it's it's an idea where uh, if you don't agree with the government on a controversial issue, uh, one where, you know, here they're ignoring basic biology, they're ignoring safety, privacy, you know, the importance of free speech and religious freedom. Uh, and it's either our way or the highway. It's vindictive and it's flat out outrageous. It's outrageous. Uh, unfortunately, though, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg with this. And if more coaches, more schools don't stand up, I fear that we're headed towards the extinction of women's sports you know, as they have been and as even they are today. Coach, I want to talk to you about that. You know, I, you know, I read that you also have coached men's basketball. You're obviously a male yourself. Can you speak to really the core of this issue, both the unfairness aspect as well as the safety aspect for especially young athletes and what it would mean if this catches on more and we have more men competing against women? Yeah. Um, again, I've coached boys basketball before. I've played at a decent level. And what you see on the core with male bodies and male athletes is a speed and a force and an aggressiveness that I know I would not feel comfortable with putting my 14-year-old daughter out there in those situations. So not only is there, the biology is self-evident, right? Uh, we've all know, known and, and see that boys, men are 20, 30, 40, 50% stronger, bigger, faster, quicker. Um, they just play with more force. And so there's the safety issue with that. Um, and then, of course, there's the fairness issue as well. But I just can't put our daughters and my kids out there on a court to play against male athletes. And I'm afraid that at some point, the only thing that might stop it is if there's going to be a serious injury and someone gets really hurt. And I'm not going to take that risk as a dad, not only with my the daughters of the parents uh, of, of our team. Right. No, completely understandable. You know, Ryan, in closing here, what I want to talk about with Alliance Defending Freedom and what you guys are doing, you know, have you heard from other schools, other coaches, other parents even that are in a similar situation that want to join this fight or take on a fight of their own as it relates to this case and, you know, the ramifications that come with it? Yeah, I, I wish this were the only incident like this, but unfortunately, as you pointed out, it's not. Uh, we're litigating several cases across the United States, you know, from uh, Connecticut to, to Idaho to, you know, places in between. Some of those cases are currently um, uh, in the middle of those court proceedings. Some are at the courts of appeals. But, yes, we've absolutely had a number of different inquiries, a number of which are now from religious schools, uh, schools that are being told if you don't change your beliefs and your policies, then you can't compete in middle school or, or high school uh, athletics. Um, and it, this is a travesty. It's a travesty for uh, the girls involved. And uh, it's a travesty for um, these schools and, and all that are um, participating. Yeah, well, you know, again, we thank Alliance Defending Freedom for everything that you guys do to stand up for parental rights, to stand up for individual rights, liberties, to stand up for what's right. Not always easy to do. Not everybody has, you know, the resources to, to play this game, but I'm so happy that you both are taking it on and spreading the word about it. Thanks for taking the time and explaining to me what's going on. And best of luck in your endeavors. We're certainly rooting for both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Toby. Thanks, Coach. All right, folks. Woke Jeopardy plays into pronoun derangement. A Willy Wonka experience exhibit in Scotland was such a scam, people called the cops. And last but not least, Wendy's and Bidenomics want to suck your pockets drier than they already are. It's time for my Losers of the Week. It's Leap Day, a day I assume is especially tricky for our president. Oh, but despite his best efforts, he did not make my list for losers of the week this week because that's just too obvious. So let's switch things up, or in this case, just make things up, like words and identities that don't exist. I'll take mental delusion for 500, Alex. Parts of speech six. Zem, Zers, Zemself. Chris. What are pronouns? Those are pronouns, neo pronouns. What in the actual F are Zem, Zeers, and Zemselves? Answer, 
make-believe pronouns created out of thin and what I assume toxic air by a generation of deranged nutcases who were so desperate to be different they classified themselves as members of some alphabet cult that only exists on social media. But just for kicks, I looked up what the hell a Zem is and after reading about it, I will never be the same. What I gathered from this website, them, Dot us is that Z and Zem terms are what they call neo pronouns created by people who felt regular ass words weren't inclusive enough. My laptop is now no doubt infected with the woke virus and in need of an exorcism. But speaking of scarring experiences, my next loser pick this week is what was dubbed the Willy Wonka inspired chocolate experience in Glasgow, Scotland. The website for this event described a mystical candy world of awe and wonder, but when ticket holders who paid about 45 bucks a head arrived at the warehouse, well, they were left in a state of shock and awe they didn't bargain for. Attendees quickly took to social media to rant about the scam. Local police even confirmed they were called to the scene after outrage experience goers cried foul and demanded refunds. This experience was surely a waste of money, big promises with very disappointing results, making me wonder if Joe Biden was indeed part of it. But speaking of our pal Joe and things he has ruined, Bidenomics has screwed our economy so much so even fast food has become unaffordable for some struggling families. And to make matters worse, fast food chain Wendy's decided to up the ante with a plan to implement Surge pricing, similar to the way rideshare apps vary pricing based on availability and demand. Wendy's plan to test out this pricing model as early as next year. Well, that was until the company got absolutely scorched for even suggesting it. The company has now vowed to scrap that poorly conceived idea. Wise move, Wendy's. Wise move. But those are my losers of the week. Please catch me on Media Buzz Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern on Fox News. But until then, from Nashville, God bless and take care.